Hello everyone, I'm Mike of Mike Reviews at All. You might also know me from over on Fights with Friends. Uh, today I have a guest, uh, Tamir. He has a background in car sales and now runs a YouTube channel um, educating the rest of us on how to go about the car sales process, kind of you know what the behind the scenes are, I guess. And he's also done some videos on safety that I found interesting. Watched a couple uh, of your videos, uh, Tamir. You want to give us a little more background about what it is you do? Yeah, absolutely. And thank you for having me on your channel. Okay, I appreciate that. Uh, my name is Tamir, and I've been cars and uh, for uh, eight years now. And um, YouTube is uh, something I've always wanted to do. And I actually had a previous background uh, from high school, of all places in media. So announcements on TV. Um, I had a radio channel in high school and in college as well. So YouTube is just kind of the next uh, big thing in media. I thought I'd combine uh, the two loves together. Yeah, I, I don't think it's going anywhere. And I've, I've had a good time on here, and it's just continuing to get bigger and bigger. Yeah, yeah. So anyway, I've only been YouTubing uh, for less than three months. And in the past three months, uh, I've gotten 116 subscribers. Uh, past 2,500 views and uh, just past 16 minutes walk time, and I haven't even barely scratched the surface of what I want to cover uh, regarding the car process and dealerships and salesmen and why they tend to act the way that they do. <laughs> yeah, I've I've definitely had some some bad experiences with them. Uh, except if I. Uh, had to choose between buying a new car and somebody asked me, you know, maybe have a little bit of cancer. I'd ask them, you know, how much cancer are ah, we talking about? That's a no brainer. That's a no brainer. <laughs> of course you pick the cancer, right? Yeah, exactly. I, I, Oh that's man, my wife that. hates going in there with me too. It's just like, I, I hate it, but it, I, I end up feeling like I'm going in there almost looking for a fight because of some of the, uh, you know, transactions I, I've had in the past, and they probably don't like me very yeah. much either. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? Um, it's not the first time that I've heard it. I've heard it many times over my career. And in fact, part of what got me into the career, which I was telling you a bit earlier, was my dad. He was, with his words, a driving car dealerships and car salesman the entire time I was growing up. And before I even had my first experience with them, I automatically had that feeling too. Where I felt like I had to defend myself or uh, just to make sure that I didn't uh, get screwed in any way. So the reason why I went into the car business was because one, I absolutely love cars. Kind of like Second, I felt like I could do something different about it uh, to make sure people have a phenomenal experience instead. Well, I, I'm, I'm glad you're doing this. Uh, I have plenty of questions for you. And I guess that one of the most annoying things to me and I've actually just gone on to a lot and just driven off until I've seen that just about everybody does this. It's like when I go, yeah. when I go to a grocery store, you know, when I go to a department store, all the prices seem to be clearly marked and you would expect uh -huh. that the mileage is clearly marked on the car. Is there a good yeah. reason that they don't do that? Well, the prices are actually relatively clearly marked, but uh what tends to get a little hairy with it would be taxes or if there's a special advertised price um, that's designed to really get the customer in the door. So, um, actually, many years ago, Congress, back in the 60s, Congress passed the Maroney Law, so all new vehicles, they have to have a window system inside their car that creates what options the vehicle has and how much the car actually is. So they are clearly marked, but... If you're buying a car and you're across the state lines, taxes can be different. Um, if you're registering the car in a specific place, so your registration will vary in the Seattle area. Um, I live in what's called an RTA, which is actually a higher license fee. And a lot of times that information can sometimes be misconstrued or misunderstood. And it can cause misunderstandings as far as the actual price. In other words, people are actually paying for the car in total uh, will be because there will be some variance. Yeah, I heard about this. I just actually found out about this law like a couple of weeks ago, coincidentally, because I'm, I'm in Snohomish County, and when I go to get my license done, luckily it's 
it's like fifty-seven dollars, and and that's it. And now they got rid of the small game. I don't know what they're going to replace it with, but what what yeah. is that law over there? So in in my particular zone, RTA zone, basically what happened is back in twenty sixteen. Uh, the people uh, voting in the local elections actually voted for a measure uh, to increase registration on vehicles. So that way it would pay for the sound transit project um, that is building a train and rebuilding basically the infrastructure of the county uh, over the next 30 years. So people really like the idea of having that better infrastructure. The problem is uh, a lot of people were against it because it's going to take 30 years to build and most of them won't even see it in their lifetime. So um now the consequence of it is instead of having, you know, a 50 or $60 license fee like you have down in Kirkland, my license fees every single year are about 500 to $600 a year on each of my vehicles. And I have two. So, you know, that's 1200 bucks a year just in registration fees. Yeah, that's, that's about what I was paying when I was in California. Cause I just lived there for a few years when my wife's from there and there was like, mm-hmm. there were, there it was like a value of your car thing. So some people's registrations could be exorbitant. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And then the newer the car and the heavier the car is, the more your license fees are going to be. So the two cars, they're, they're, they're average cars. They're not particularly expensive. But still, uh, one of my cars, which is a 2003, which would normally have you know a 50 or $60 license fee, has about a $300 license fee every single year. You know, definitely a lot of variants and all those different variants, you know, can use a lot of customers because a lot of customers just want to go into the dealership and they just want to know exactly how much they're going to be paying after tax, title and license, et cetera. Yeah, I I have actually my experience was was sometimes I had to get up in the window, I guess. But what I was saying was it was it was not clear at some places for me to see like any prices. And I guess. Yeah, exactly. And there could be a couple of reasons for that. Uh, one is um, a vehicle that uh, just comes on the lot. Uh, it may not have been priced yet. It could have been a vehicle that is, uh, you know, a very rare configuration that there are only so many samples that are out there. Um, so that being said, um, typically a dealership has a process that takes more or less two to seven days to actually fully recondition a vehicle that they acquire. Um, they just have to put a um, a sticker in there that's called the uh, buyer's guide. So in Washington State, every buyer's guide has to state what the vehicle is, it states what the vision is, it states if it's being sold as is or if it's being sold with a warranty. Um, However, something that's interesting is the buyer's guide does not actually require the prices. So it's kind of interesting because the idea behind it is to protect the consumer and it lets the car is available for sale but as far as uh, pricing goes, the only way to know what it's priced at is basically if the dealership has already done its due diligence to see what other vehicles are priced in the market or, you know, if they just expressly tell you we're going to sell this car for X amount of dollars. Uh, okay. Yeah, that kind of answers that. So, um, uh, my, my last uh, car that I bought, I, I was again dreading uh, as, I, as I went in here and I, I kind of had a bad feeling for some reason about the car. It's like, seems to be something not quite right, but I drove around for a while. I'm like, ah, huh, maybe it's just me. I made the mistake. I didn't have it checked out by a mechanic and yep. I spent $6,000 on a car that had a blown head gasket. Sure. Yeah. That's no yeah, which I, I've had replaced. And then, of course, he tries... I, I won't name the car dealership of, or what city it's in, so don't worry. But, uh, you know, he hey. says, well, you can take it over to my mechanic, you know, uh-huh. and he'll give you a discount over there. And I was like, wow, this kind of, to me, maybe it's not, but, you know, it seemed kind of even more shady. Uh, how, yeah. how much diagnostic is there generally, you think, in used cars when people bring them in? It's just a generic car. Um, a lot of the smaller dealerships, um, I would say very little. Basically, what they're checking for is they're checking higher tread length, tread length, if there's any obvious um, oil leaks. Um, basically, and that's pretty much it. Uh, some of them won't even change the oil or change the filter. Um, my dealership, we do because it's a larger dealership. But, um, you know, most of the smaller dealerships uh, won't even go through the effort of uh, doing any of that. Um, they're basically just interested in doing the minimum amount of work possible to be compliant in Washington State. 
So, so would you recommend someone you think to go to a a, a bigger uh, dealership, especially if they didn't you know didn't know somebody personally? Yes, yeah, general I would recommend that because the, the bigger dealerships uh, they have a lot more to lose. So, my dealership, for example, it's a new franchise and the used vehicles. They'll still do a very thorough inspection on it. And if anything that would, you know, be extremely costly to the customer, they'll actually go ahead and they'll sell it at the auction. So another smaller dealership will basically pick it up and then try to resell it. Um, our franchise dealerships, because they want to protect their reputation, they only want to sell the cars that are, you know, in the best uh, mechanical shape. And uh, a lot of them uh, will even certify some of their cars as low enough with low enough miles and have a clean car. Yeah, I've I've seen some of these certifications that they sell, and some uh, car lots that sell extra warranties. I've I've heard yes. uh, a lot of people that aren't happy with a lot of these warranties. What's what's your opinion on those? Aaron, are there some that are not so good, and some that are beneficial? Yes, yeah, there are some that are not good, and then there are some that are actually quite beneficial. And I actually did a video of this um, two weeks ago. Um, of all the different set protections that in the finance office, the finance officer will offer to the customer. And my opinion of it was if you are financing the vehicle for the amount of time that you're financing it, you need to have warranty coverage. And that is absolutely a no brainer. And it has to be uh, bumper to bumper coverage. So the warranties will be just powertrain warranties, which will only cover the internal lubricated parts of the engine, transmission, all wheel drive, if it's an all wheel drive vehicle, which Usually that's the customer's, um, you know, biggest concerns uh, with a vehicle. However, things like seats or uh, head gaskets, like in the case of your vehicle, will actually not be covered because they qualify as riders with most warranty companies. So that being said, um, you know, you do want to get a warranty that has as much coverage as possible, and especially cover things like the electronics or the wiring or the power equipment in the car, because typically it's not a life. Uh, net cars are, you know, made very differently than, you know, many years ago. Those are the things that are likely to go wrong after the warranty is up. So they want it protected in case of an expensive burn. Okay. Yeah. Um, that that makes sense because in the past, a lot of people, you know, have been pretty negative towards me, towards the warranties. And, you know, I've kind of yeah. had an idea towards them. Like, I don't buy, I don't buy warranties when I go to Best Buy because it's like it, – most of the time, it doesn't really make sense, and on my phone, exactly. for the amount of the exactly that the exactly. product is. You do want to be careful because there are some uh, for some dealerships that you know they sell you a car. They'll ask if you want a warranty, and most of the time, the warranty it costs several thousand dollars. Most clients will say, "Oh no, I'd much rather just you know chance on it." But um, you know, if you have a good enough warranty coverage, you know then you have a more perfected car payment. Because if you don't purchase a warranty, that's a coverage warranty, let's say your car breaks down, then you have to pay your car payment and you have to pay for the repair on top of that. And most clients, unfortunately, are for that. So that's why I said you want to have that full coverage protection. But if you buy something that's just like a powertrain warranty, it really covers very little. So if your door lock actuator, for example, fails, you're going to have to pay out of pocket about $400. Uh, in fact, my personal car, just just to give you an idea, I bought a uh, 2014 Mazda, actually from a Mazda store, and I just purchased it uh, without any warranty on it. So, I, And I knew what I was getting into, and I expected the car to be in fairly good shape, which it was. But a month and a half after I bought it, of all things, Bluetooth went out in the car. So I had to buy a new Bluetooth head unit, so I had to make a car payment. And I had a $660 repair on top of the car payment. So that was a lesson learned. And that's part of the reason why I formed my opinion the way that I did. Okay. Yeah, no, that, that, that makes sense. And Bluetooth have definitely gotten a lot better than they were 10, 15 years ago in cars. I know that. For sure. <laughs> so definitely a necessity. We don't want people calling and texting uh, while yeah. they're driving. Absolutely. Uh, what, one even thing, a, oh, go ahead. I was going to say, even a law in uh, Washington State, uh, that, um, if you get caught um, with a um, with a cell phone up your ear, uh, the police will write you a ticket. Oh, yeah. It's, it's one of the most aggressive laws, I believe, in the country that distracted 
driving along. Yeah. I actually did a review video on that, and there was some weird verbiage in there that had people concerned because it said if they had an infraction while they were, like, eating or, or drinking soda. And I, personally, I was a little worried about it, but I, it doesn't yeah. seem to have as much bite to it as it looked on paper, at least so far. Right, right, right. Well, it's interesting because they call it E U I, an electronic U I. Yeah, that uh, that is interesting. Uh, but one one of the other things I'm uh, very interested in is uh, when you go in and, and negotiate a car price. I've went to dealerships where they seem very, uh, you know, very willing to negotiate the price that's on there, and then some of them, and it's like were straight to the sticker price and of course i've as you know and most of you probably know sometimes a lot of that is if you're paying cash or if you're financing but i mean how how much wiggle room do you would you say most salespeople have you know it it, it really, it really uh, most experienced salespeople expect to negotiate this you know whether it's off the pricing on the car it's negotiating all weather floor mats or a gas or an extra key, you know, something like that, that gives a lot more value than just simply the dollar amount for the car. But depending on the car that you're looking at, um, if you're looking at a car that's a fairly common car, like Toyota Camry, a Honda Accord, a uh, Nissan Altima, something like that, you know, the dealership will typically have multiple the lot and they'll typically be more willing to negotiate because that's a volume car for them. And the incentive is sell, 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 sell. However, if you're looking at something that's a bit more of a unicorn and a bit more rare and is a very hot car in particular, then they're not, they're not necessarily going to negotiate uh, with the clients on that car because you know, if you're not willing to take it, they can find another buyer very easily that will. So that being said, um, uh, as far as the markup scale, uh, new cars actually don't have that much markup like people, you know, some people expect you know, 20, 30, 40% markup. Most new vehicles have anywhere from 3 to 5% markup uh, between uh, their MSRP and their, which is the cost that the dealership acquired it for. Oh, really? That That's good to know because I was looking, when I buy my new car, I was like, I'm going to, you know, I'm like, I'm going to go to the deal, you know, the actual manufacturer online and I'm going to pay the docking uh, fee and have it delivered to the dealership. I'm like, I'm not dealing with this, but that's, yeah, that's good to know. yeah. That's actually an interesting point that you bring up uh, because uh, franchise laws actually require uh, new cars to be purchased at dealerships. So a lot of times you'll see on that window sticker that we were talking about a little bit earlier in the interview, you'll see a destination charge, which is sometimes 900 bucks, sometimes 1000 bucks. So at my store, it's just under 1000 bucks. But that's literally $1,000 that the manufacturer charges to the dealership and then charges to the customer just to ship the car to the store, basically. You're required by law first from if it's a new car. So it's a little bit um, uh, of an antiquated law. And um, actually, one manufacturer that um, was doing a really good job selling directly to the consumer and kind of, you know, trying to go around the clock and really differentiated themselves was Tesla. Oh. So Tesla actually has a direct-to-consumer model, and um, it actually set them apart, uh, especially about five or six years ago when their Model S came out. And a lot of people you know, started like Tesla. And what's really interesting is it started to kind of backwards, started to use more of a dealer franchise instead, end up having to charge a destination basically to fix the car for you, which you would have to anyway. Uh, that, that, is my, that is my dream car is uh, a Tesla. I want the Tesla for like my more everyday driver and then i do really like classic cars so i a couple of classic cars in the garage but uh-huh I, I am very impressed with those yeah no they are really impressive vehicles i will say um all of them, uh, tesla is an entire other channel that i could even start because um they're definitely um they're definitely one of the talks about right now as far as other business practices as far as their vehicles and how advanced they are so on and so forth yeah, there's a guy who started a channel recently. I was listening to it um, on Joe Rogan. He actually quit his job to be on Joe Rogan. And he, uh, I don't know if you've heard this story before, but he bought a junked out Tesla, like completely from a flood. And yeah. 
Yeah, you heard about that. He put it back together completely. That was amazing. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I've watched his videos, actually. I forget what his, what his name is right now, but I've totally watched this video. Yeah. Well, I'll try to put that in the description for everybody because I think people would find that very interesting, what he had to go through. It's like, uh, I, knew, yeah. I know he knew it was going to be hard, but I don't think he thought it was going to be that hard, and Tessa wouldn't help him either. <laughs> no, of course not, because it's proprietary information they'd be giving up. Yeah. Yeah, I, I understand that part of it. But yeah, I, I found his story to be uh, absolutely uh, amazing, especially not being yeah. very mechanical myself. So, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, it, it is truly an amazing vehicle. Uh, electric vehicles in general, I think uh, they are going to be the way of the future. Um, so it'll be interesting to see um, uh, what manufacturers are doing over the next, you know, 10, 15, 20 years um, to basically make uh, cars uh, more green or um, energy efficient. Uh, I really think so, too, and I, I really hope so. Um, and saying that, it makes me think of something that I've seen in your video that you did on safety, actually. Cause, uh, oh, what was that you saw? Uh, was, uh, I believe it was the last video you posted, or maybe it was uh, second to last. And I, I'm, always, I'm a little concerned and very interested in self-driving cars. And you were talking about yeah. uh, the stay-in-lane function. Yes, yes. I, there, there's, there's definitely, I got a little bit of flack for posting that actually. And I would say when I go on a drive with my customers, you know, it's one of the features that is one of those or miss features. And almost always, you know, it's one of those features when it comes down to uh, negotiation, it's a feature where the customer thinks, well, we tried it and it wasn't 100% reliable. So it's really worth paying extra money for that feature. So that's part of the reason why I put it in the video. And the other reason is if you take the negotiation aspect out of it, but if you actually apply it to, you know, driving every day, you know, there's so many variables that have to be correct. It has to be a clear day out. You can't use it at night. The markers have to be clearly marked. So if it's on an older road, uh, the piece is faded, you know, it may not necessarily work as intended. So that's why it's not necessarily, you know, worth the extra money for the safety fee. That's not a hundred percent reliable. Yeah, and I hope people weren't actually just taking their hands off the wheels and just letting the thinking the car was going to stay in its lane the whole time. Hopefully, there wasn't too much well, of that. Mike, believe it or not, they they are taking their hands completely off the steering wheel, you know, to just to see if it works. And it's, that's not the only feature, but I'm just on many test drives that you know a lot of the features that I mentioned in the um, the video that I posted uh, just last week. People were literally accelerating into the car to see if the front braking would would work, or you know, like would let their hands off the steering wheel, or if the car in reverse and they would let their hands off the steering wheel and off the brake. You know, with blind spot monitor, they don't bother looking over their shoulder anymore. And basically, people have gotten so reliant on these safety features that they think the car is just going to drive itself, but they don't even bother, you know, using actual driving habits that they learned from driver's ed. Yeah, yeah, I heard you. You were talking about that with the, yeah, the the blind spot thing. I was thinking, oh man, that would be a pretty cool thing. And it's like, I I I'd yeah. like to say, you know, hopefully that I would never get to the point to where I would stop looking over as much. But I mean, we're as humans, we're, we're kind of lazy sometimes. We are, and, and to be fair, you know, I said my full car actually twenty fourteen months, but I said hear me because a lot of cars are coming up with this blind monitor and. As a salesperson, a lot of clients are requesting that feature um, in brand new cars. But the problem with it is it does have its limitations. So, for example, it only senses one lane over. So, if somebody from lane over is merging at the same time you're merging in lane, that could cause a crash. The other thing is, um, you know, again, if it's dark out, if it's foggy out, um, if it's not clear, you know, the sensor could very well not work. And so, the only way to push somebody is driving in your or intended moving there is to turn your head briefly, look over your shoulder at your blind spot to see if somebody's there. Yeah, that, uh, that, that worries me. People, you know, people depending on the technology in their cars. I mean, uh, the self-driving yeah. thing that, you know, both infatuates me and scares the, the, the crap out of me. That's a whole nother thing, but yeah, well, the really scary part is, um, uh, it's people's life stake. So that's what the um, kind of um, like joke a video where I said, you know, 
mostly safety features that are fantastic for my business, for your life expectancy. Because I've actually seen a lot more customers at the dealership because um, they've had you know, fairly you know, late model year cars with these safety features, and then the cars ended up getting totaled, and now they have to buy another one. So great for me. I get more business, but at the same time, it's put a lot of people's lives at stake. Oh, yeah, I seen that you said that like 92%, the reason 92% of the people go to buy a new car is because they crashed their old one. <laughs> it's, they crashed an old one and uh, it was totaled out, exactly. Yeah, man, it makes sense. That's that's pretty much me. I pretty much, at least right now, and I, I pretty much drive my cars into the ground unless I, you know, if I see you know, a great deal on a classic car I really wanted, I might put it in the garage but otherwise yeah i'm pretty much driving it until it doesn't run anymore yeah exactly exactly so we have the 2014 uh, which you know only has 50 some thousand miles on it and then uh, we also 2003 car which is still running strong so we've been holding on to those uh, for a long time and in general you know most of my clients so you know, like if they're more if they're more tuned to personal finance and you know what's the best way to basically not lose your turn on the car I would say make sure that you're getting a car that fits your needs and hold on to it for as long as possible because clients that typically use their cars more frequently, they're the ones that have all this depreciation and they're constantly paying higher and higher car payments because they keep rolling negative equity um, into their next car, which is actually another video that I did probably about a month ago, how to prevent parking negative equity in your garage. Yeah, that, that, that drives me nuts, especially with younger people and I kind of try to try to steer them away from that. I remember having to go to a car lot actually when my my youngest sister was, she was 17 years old and she was working at Jack in the Box and uh -huh. she drives up in like, uh, it couldn't have been more than a year old Mustang with like all the features and everything. Uh -huh. And she's, I mean, minimum wage in, in Eastern Washington, it was like, I don't know, seven bucks an hour at the time. And I was like, yeah. what are you doing? I'm like, get in the car. We're going to go back mm -hmm. to the car dealership right now. And yeah. again, I'm going to give him a piece of my mind. I had to talk to him for quite a while, but eventually they took the car back. But I mean, she, she would have gotten repoed pretty much, you know, 100%. She didn't even make enough to have the car. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. That actually reminds me of a, uh, another video we did, um, myself and uh, my finance director. We actually had to repossess the car from a customer because um, uh, some of the, or not just the income, but several things that he stated um, when he applied to buy a car um, were false. And basically, when we tried to get correct information from him, he kept beating us. Uh, and it got to the point where he was essentially driving our car for free for three weeks. And when we finally did find a car above us out um, where the car was, had an extra key. And uh, we took it, and we gave him a notice uh, saying that we took the car back because the car was for his, and it was technically stolen. So, anyway, I'm, uh, you know, I do, I do see a lot of it at the time where, you know, some clients will either try to take advantage of the system, and unfortunately, I do still see, you know, some younger people uh, getting taken advantage of just because they see a brand new, you know, shiny, you know, whatever the car is. And, you know, they, they will literally do the minimum amount it takes just to get into the car. But for sure, the car is going to get repossessed and leave them in a terrible financial situation. Yeah, that, that, that's horrible. Um, gets to that point. Um, a, a lot of my viewers uh, uh, on this channel and, and on my, my bigger channel, a lot of the viewers on this channel actually come from my bigger channel, subscribe to both. But uh a lot of them are yeah. like me. They're not, you know, I'm, I'm not super wealthy. And some of them are younger. They're looking for, uh, if someone had, you know, $5,000, a minimum, like three to $5,000, um, what would your advice be to them? A lot of them, you know, maybe being, you know, single or maybe just married without kids, uh, a, a yeah. good value card to go out and buy and a good way to go about buying it. Yeah. If, if, if they have three to five thousand um, dollars, say you know, don't use all of it for the first. Like let's like if you have a thousand, for example, use only three thousand for a car, um, and then that three thousand uh, dollars, depending on what you find out there, handful of cars that are you know decent for that price point, but you have to go through a lot of looking. So you want to make sure that it's a car that you know 
uh, is, is found really mechanical space. Just definitely take it to a mechanic, and if they don't let you take it to the mechanic, then that's already signed. Um, this is if you're looking at a private party. Um, if you're looking at dealerships, um, many dealerships, uh, besides the small mom pop ups, will have those, you know, three to five thousand dollar cars. So it may actually be better to calculate um, a monthly basis for a newer car that you could finance that's safer, you know, that's uh, more fuel efficient, you know, that's uh, in more reliable condition and actually comes with some warranty coverage. So, for example, let's say one of your younger you know, um, married uh, buyers but doesn't have children because that's actually my situation. I'm married and my wife and I, we don't have kids yet. You know, what we did uh, with our Mazda is we financed it because we didn't have the money to pay for it um, in full. But we put a payment of $2,000 and we had a $350 payment. And that was five years. What we ended up doing is we just ended up paying it off early whenever we were able to. So we just paid it off probably two months ago. And that was uh, within, you know, two and a half of the five-year term. So we paid it off way sooner than expected. So my best advice would be, you know, if you just want to pay cash and not have car payments, if income is really limited, then, you know, do a lot of digging and try and find something that you can, you know, pay for cash. Otherwise, um, if your needs are a little bit more uh, family-oriented, like you're obviously trying to protect all the occupants, like, you know, your husband or wife um, or your pets, or if you do have children, you may want to look at something newer and finance it, but make sure that you calculate a decent budget so you're not breaking the bank. Yeah, uh, that makes sense to me. I mean, we're uh, me and my wife, we both have finance cars now, but yeah, we have... We have two teenagers, and then we also have our mother-in-law lives with us. So, I mean, safety, you know, is pretty big concern. She's got the the, the soccer yeah. mom van, and that's actually what she likes. So I'm like, all right. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. But if, if you're a younger married couple, like, for example, my wife and I, we drive a Mazda 6 sedan, and we have a 2003 Honda Accord as well. So are they the flashiest of cars? No, but there's a reason why you see so many of them on the road, just because they're fuel efficient, they're comfortable, they're fairly well often for what they are, and, you know, they're reliable and they'll last for a very long time. So you don't necessarily need to have the nicest, you know, Dodge Demon or Dodge Hellcat, or you don't need, you know, a Ford Mustang a GT350 or anything like that, you know. They're very fun cars, but that's if you have the disposable income uh, to spend on those. Um, otherwise, if you're, you know, like most of your viewers or most, like most of my viewers, we're just everyday people, you just need something that gets you from point A to point comfortably and reliably. Yeah, I, I, just the cars that you mentioned, that's usually what I'm looking for if I'm, when I'm worried. And hopefully, you know, usually I'm trying to, hey, this car's kind of getting towards maybe the end of its life or at least, you know, uh, deeper into the second half. I'm going to start looking for a Honda Accord, a Toyota Corolla, uh, uh -huh. a Hyundai, Hyundai Accent, which I think Hyundai is pretty underrated. They're been pretty dependable i think they do a pretty good job yeah i would definitely agree with that but uh let's uh, let's have some fun for a minute though uh like yeah my money no money really no object what car does tamir want or somebody's just gonna give you uh a, a you know and the car of your the car of your dreams man, is there something man. you have in mind that you've been daydreaming over <laughs> I am so glad you gave me license to spend a bunch of money that's not my own because my clients never do that with me. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I, I think I and I are kind of like, some classic cars that I would um, take. Um, in fact, I'm actually starting a mini series on YouTube trips where I'm going to be reviewing cars that anymore aren't made anymore for. So that should be interesting. Um, so most of the cars, one of them, that's a dream, is. Uh, the Buick GNS 1980s. Um, in fact, uh, one of my favorite automotive uh, uh, YouTubers who actually inspired me to start on YouTube, his name is Doug DeGiro. Uh Just a couple of weeks ago, he actually did a review of that car. And it was the first uh, that I think of all seeing review of the car, I just thought it was and, and just made me want the car even more. So I really love that car. Um, I love this early 1990s uh, Mazda RX-7 platform. Um, I think it's one of the most beautifully of all time. Um, if I were to take an Italian car, I really love the Ferrari F355 Coupe uh, in the 1990s. So most of my 
guitars are basically the 1980s and 1990s from when I was a little kid. And basically, you know, those posts that I kept in, inside my bedroom growing up that, you know, never could have been having. But you know, in the next coming years, if I have any disposable income, I would definitely have one in my garage. Yeah, a, a lot of people end up going after the cars that they seen during childhood. I'm 40 years old, so like for me, it was... It, it, it's the 60s muscles car. I, I had my first car, actually, and this makes me sound like completely mm-hmm. spoiled, but my dad just, uh, he put more emphasis. Uh, I re- really appreciate it, put more emphasis on me having a new car than uh, maybe he should have, but it was it was a 69 Chevy Nova, big block. Oh, yeah. 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 And I, I've wanted and one I've again won ever for, since. For... Yeah. For muscle cars, that's actually a really, really underrated car, you know, because most people that for Bell SS is, um, so Impala's are actually getting really popular, you know, but the Chevy that was kind of an underdog, you know, compared to other six muscle cars, and it's surprisingly fun. Yeah, yeah, I, I really enjoyed mine. Got, got in a lot of trouble with it because, you know, it was given to me when I was 18 years old. I don't know that I would advise that, but... Uh... <laughs> Unfortunately, I didn't have car the car for very long, no. but yeah, <laughs> I had. I I actually didn't destroy it. I had some mechanical problems. It was uh, stupid of me. I uh, and I sold it temporarily to a, a, an, an uncle of mine who's uh, se- he since passed, but he wasn't the most responsible person on earth to put it. Uh, mildly and I sold it to him very cheap and you know uh, with the agreement that I would come back and buy the car within the next year well when I came back mm-hmm. into town about six seven months later he had sold the car to someone who had taken it somewhere else yeah. and I could never track it back down <laughs> yeah <laughs> but yeah classic cars are definitely big for me uh, classic car, there's just, it, it's not the nostalgia, there's a particular aura of it because, you know, during the different eras, the cars, you know, they had different trends that kind of dictated their giant, these particular survivors, you know. There's unique back then, which I carried all the way through, you know, to the very day that people remember about them. Yeah, I, I, I don't know. I, I like to say that I like the character of them, which I guess maybe just sounds generic. Maybe it's just one of those things that, you know, it got stuck in my head as a child and it's like, okay, this is what's cool. So this is what uh-huh. I want now. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. So definitely if I get one of those uh, three cars, those are probably my top three. Uh, there's a whole lovely list of cars, you know, that would probably take, you know, far longer than you probably allotted for this to go over because I could talk about it forever. But, you know, those three are definitely my top three. Well, we have a lot, I know we have a lot of classic car fanatics on, on, on my channel. Sports fans, fight fans also seem to be where, 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 you know, we're we're a bunch of, you know, I don't know, what do you call it? goofball Neanderthals. We like fast car. We go fast. We watch fight, you know, <laughs> kind of thing. Yeah. So, but. Exactly. It's a, it, it's a lot of fun. We're just guys, but uh, uh, you're you're doing a great job with your channel. I really have to uh, compliment uh, your editing. Very informational uh, for guys that check out your channel. Um, I like how you really get straight to the point. You can tell that uh, you put uh, you're very aware of the fact of people's time and not to waste their mm-hmm. time. So very concise. So thank you for that. I appreciate that. Well, thank you. I appreciate it. Yeah. All right. Well, hey, thanks for thanks for coming on the show. Uh, I appreciate uh, you coming on here. Everybody, go over to your site, uh, Tamir. I wasn't sure how to pronounce your last name. I didn't want to get it wrong. That's okay. It's Tamir. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes I have some issues with some of those names, but. Yeah, thanks again. Everybody go over to his channel, check it out. Make sure that you hit the like button over there too and comment to Tamir so he knows that you've been over there. And also, if you don't mind, put that you came from Fights of Friends so we can kind of gauge how uh, successful this was. And uh, thanks again, Tamir. I really appreciate you coming on. 
No problem. Thank you so much for having me, and you have a wonderful day. You too. Thank you. All right, uh-huh. everybody. As always, I love you. I respect you. And I'll see you all next time.